It's a beautiful day to learn about macroeconomics, but before we start, I just wanted to say thank you guys for tagging along on this journey as we engage in this spirit quest of learning on the internet, and I really enjoyed attempting to make this work, and we'll keep up the good fight. Uh, you know, in some ways this could be a huge advantage for us. We'll see how it works out, but either way, I'm happy to keep rocking and rolling if you guys are. And without further ado, the banking system. Let's see if I can zoom in. Okay, so chapter four is pretty chill. It's also pretty recent, so in a lot of ways, I think you guys will feel like this is pretty fresh in your mind, and that's pretty rad because we kind of just did banking, which is pretty sweet. So it begins with unit four, financial assets. And the discussion is about what exactly is an asset. And the question is answered by saying, well, it's liquid in cash, but it can also be other things too. M1 is cash plus demand deposits, but it could also be a bond, which is a physical IOU where you give somebody cash and then they're going to pay you back with interest. So high interest is good on a bond. It could be a stock, which is equity or ownership in a company. And stock is good, but it's also very volatile, as we found out in the stock market the last two weeks. And watch out, as a pro tip, remember that interest rates and bond prices are inversely related. So if one goes up, the other one goes down. The next thing that kids always struggle with, which I think is like, it's addition. So I realize why, you know, um, no, I don't. I think the words are what throw people off because we get these word problems and then you see a bunch of words and then there are numbers correlated and you're like, what the heck should I do? If there's ever a question where they give you a real value, a nominal value, or an, an, uh, excuse me, or an inflation price level change value, they're almost certainly talking about the equation, which is real plus inflation equals nominal. There's nothing super complicated happening here, but you just need to remind yourself to chill, write the equation down, plug the numbers in, and you're going to get the problem right. The next section in Unit 4 is this concept of the functions of money, which seem complicated and awkward, but they're really you know, pretty straightforward. The first one is medium of exchange, which is this idea that money is used to trade things, so it's the lubricant in the trail. Oh, why do I always use that example? Moving on, <laughs> uh, unit of account refers to our ability to say, okay, this cup, for example, which is majestic and a gift from a student, is worth $5, and putting that $5 symbol on it, uh, you know, that valuation allows me to account for its value, which kind of segues nicely into the third function, which is the store of value. I know that if this is worth $5 in 10 years, maybe it'll still be worth $5. So, you know, money is still money in the future, and hopefully it retains its value over time. We also talk about the money supply, which on the macro exam, I think is gonna come in one of three ways or flavors if we are gonna use continuity and language. M0 or the monetary base, MB, just refers to currency plus reserves in bank, not demand deposit, but basically just currency which is accessible immediately. M1 is cash plus all demand deposits plus M0. And then M2 is longer term savings plus M1. So M2 includes the most items, M1 is the most narrow, and M0 is even more narrow beyond that. Kind of moving on is this idea of the bank balance sheet, where kids often freak out, and they don't need to. Like, I'm on both sides at one time, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, because, you know, we did really good mastering this concept. You have assets and liabilities on the other side. Assets are things you have, liabilities are things you owe. And just to keep it kind of simple, uh, the required reserves are what the Fed says that a bank has to keep in its vault. The excess reserves are available in case they want to lend them out and use them later. And then finally, loans are previously issued loans, so they can't call them back in. And that's actually how banks make money in the real world. So the fractional banking system is good and the money supply grows because we want loans. Loans are what actually creates money in the world. Never forget, the money multiplier is 1 over the reserve requirement. So here, the reserve requirement is 10%, and that means that any additional loans, so that $1,000 excess reserves, if those are lent out, we would multiply that times 10. And if the bank lent this out, and every single person who took out a loan, you know, put it back in a bank, and it was re-lent out, so on and so forth, for eternity, the most we could create in the economy advancing the money supply would be $10,000 in this scenario. Just watch out, this multiplier sometimes understates the multiplied effect because people hold their cash or they just lose it like coins in the sofa, if you will. The last two things are money market graph and the loanable funds market. 
The money market graph can be invoked for a lot of reasons, but most likely on the exam, it's going to have to do with uh, monetary policy, not fiscal, monetary policy. Fiscal is taxing and spending. Monetary policy is what the Fed does. You have three flavors here. Open market operations, discount rate, reserve ratio. Open market operations are almost always used on the exam as the go-to monetary policy. Remember, buy bonds, the money supply gets bigger. It would shift to the right. Sell bonds, money supply gets smaller, and it would shift to the left because we're buying bonds. We're literally giving people cash in that scenario. The other two Fed policies would be the discount rate and the reserve ratio. Expansionary would be lowering the discount rate, lowering the reserve ratio. Contractionary would be raising them. A little pro tip here, just something to watch out for. Uh, if banks are charging each other money for loans, like they have to call each other because they ran out, we're going to call that the federal funds rate or the overnight loans rate. Those are the same thing. It's just the interest rate the banks charge each other. Nothing too insane. Another kind of quirky thing here is the demand line on the money market graph. Sorry, this is like backwards. <laughs> the demand line refers to your want for cash. Oh, my doorbell just rang. That's fun. And effectively, there are three things that can, that can change that. Inflation, deflation, asset demand, and transaction demand. If any of those things are increasing or decreasing, it will change your desire to hold cash. And if you demand money, it would shift right. And that would effectively raise nominal interest rates. So the more people want cash, it's logical, interest rates would go up. The last graph that really matters is, oh, there is a flaw in monetary policy I forgot to mention, which is that it takes a while to manifest. So like right now, the Fed is trying to inject a bunch of money into the economy, but it doesn't like hit your wallet right away. And you're certainly not going to go out and buy a house like the second the Fed drops interest rates. So kind of watch yourself because it might take a really long time for the Fed to actually, for the monetary policy to actually help average everyday Americans when they're on the struggle bus. Hashtag 2020. <laughs> okay. Oh, by the way, universal basic income has suddenly become very popular. We'll see how that turns out. Last but not least is loanable funds market, which is the most chillax and least spicy graph and macro. You have real interest rates on the vertical axis as opposed to nominal in the money market graph. So this one is without inflation. That is one. That one is with inflation because remember the Fed's trying to curtail literally inflation or deflation. And so here, it's effectively a graph depicting all of the cash in banks. And you should think of the supply line literally as savings in banks and the demand line as people wanting that cash in banks to take out a loan, to buy a house, to finance a new business, to, you know, pay for school or something. The most common shifters are going to be crowding out, which is basically deficit spending. And that's when the government spends money they don't have from tax revenue. Other than that, uh, the supply line is going to change based on savings. If it's an open economy, it could be foreign investors sending our money to the United States. That would be like inflow here on, on the financial account. If it's a closed economy, meaning no trade, it would just be anything that incentivizes you to save or not. The demand line for loans uh, refers to basically people's aspirations and appetite for borrowing. So if there's an investment tax credit, for example, the government says build a new house and we'll give you a tax credit, that would increase the demand for loans in the local funds market, which would also drive up real interest rates. So that's kind of fun. That said, unit four, completion. I hope you guys have an awesome day and, you know, like, subscribe, maybe just like, you know, uh, get a cup of coffee and chill while we engage in this quest of the internet. Have a good day and uh, peace out.